One does not simply walk into Mordor. The land of shadow. Welcome, everybody. Uh, today's shadow cast is a breakdown of all things evil in uh, episode three, uh, Adar, of the Lord of the Rings, the Rings of Power. Uh, we'll be focusing on three regions of Middle Earth. Uh, first is going to be the introduction of the capital city um, of Numenor, uh, and then we move on to the Harfoots in the Vale of Anduin, and finally, uh, the Orc Pit in the Southlands. Um, you know, I have only one thing to say before we begin. Release the warg. Uh, I am so excited by the way this new warg looks in episode three. Uh, it looks wild. Uh, it's like a demented wolf uh, that's all muscle teeth and crazy eyes. Um, and I, I tell you, I just can't wait to see more of, of those, those kind of wargs in Middle Earth. So let's go ahead and get started and dissect all things evil in episode three of The Lord of the Rings, The Rings of Power. In the land of Mordor, where the shadows lie. Let's begin the shadow cast on the Sundering Sea, where Galadriel and Halibran are rescued by none other than Elendil, who will one day be the first king of Gondor and Arnor in Numenor's realms in exile. I love Lloyd Owen's portrayal. He brings an appropriate gravitas to the character. Then we land in the city of Armenelos, the city of kings in Numenor which has a very Athenian look. The visuals are gorgeous. Galadriel and Halibran are brought before the queen. I got an immediate Game of Thrones vibe in Numenor. You can sense the intrigue and competing forces at play in this kingdom. Much is veiled and not what it seems. The Eldar are no longer permitted on the shores of Numenor and Galadriel's presence is not welcome. The king's men are fully in control and the faithful remain hidden. It is decided that in three days, the fate of Galadriel and Halibran will be determined. There are a couple of important things that occur in these scenes in Numenor. To my surprise, we see that Tar Mariel and Ar Farazan are in allegiance, or so it seems. We find out that King Tar Palantir, the last rightful heir of Numenor, has been supplanted and is now a recluse in the tower of Tar Minister. Elendil, who we learn is secretly an elf friend and one of the faithful, takes Galadriel to a library saved by Tar Palantir, which holds scrolls of the Eldar. There is a wonderful painting of the brothers Elros and Elrond. Documents in the Black Speech were brought to Numenor by a spy many years ago. Galadriel realizes that the symbol of Sauron is in fact a depiction of Mordor. So the rumor is true. I love how the writers are using the map of Middle-earth as a key aspect of the show. We see the map in the library erupt in a vision of fire, as we've seen the symbol of Sauron do before. The inscription in the Black Speech speaks not only of a place, but also a plan. A plan by which they may create a realm of their own, where evil will not only endure and thrive. A plan to be enacted in the event of Morgoth's defeat. While in Numenor, we discover that Halibran is more than he seems. While in the library, Galadriel also seeks the meaning of the talisman Halibran wears about his neck. 
It indicates he is the descendant of kings who once rallied the men of the Southlands into a great army. Halibrand reminds her these men she speaks of were in allegiance to Morgoth. I have a very strong feeling this might be a setup for the story of the Witch King, or at least one of the other Nazgûl. Finally, we see Miriel mounting the steps of what I believe is the Tower of Tar Minister. She enters a high chamber and speaks to someone we cannot see. I think she is talking to her father, the fallen king Tar Palantir which sounds like she is really one of the faithful. I love the intrigue. I also believe this is where the Palantir we have seen is located uh, that we saw in the trailers. Next, we move on to the Vales of Anduin and the camp of the Harfoots, who are preparing for their next migration. The rustic ancestors of the hobbits engage in a sort of pagan ceremony as they prepare to leave. Nori gets caught up in some funny antics as she tries to take one of the star charts used by their leader, Sadak Burroughs, which he uses for their migrations. She finally gets hold of it and takes it to her hut, planning to show it later to the stranger. We see Nori's parents worrying about the start of the migration and whether they will be able to keep up with the father's hurt leg. The Harfoots have a beautiful tradition of honoring those who fall behind on the trail. Sadak reads their names and the Harfoots respond, We wait for you. We learn in an emotional moment that the family of Poppy Proudfellow were all lost in a landslide leaving her an orphan. This is all good character development. As the ceremony continues, the stranger comes looking for food and finds the star map. He takes the map to the fire and sees his constellation. Is it just me, or does this also look like the symbol of Sauron and Mordor? Hmm. Oddly, all the fires begin to spark and flash, and the star map catches on fire. As the stranger tries to put it out, he stumbles into the Harfoot ceremony and calls out Nori's name. The Harfoots are angry with Nori for breaking their laws and threaten her with de-caravanning. However, in the end, they forgive her because of her young age. The next day, as the Harfoots begin their migration to the grove, Brandyfoots struggle to keep up, It is then that they discover that the stranger has been in their cart the entire time. He offers help. He says he is a friend. This means that they will not fall behind on the trail to the grove. Now we move on to the darkest part of this breakdown, the orc pit. We start with Arondir, who awakens as he is dragged through the orc tunnel. He is overcome with horror at all he sees around him. This scene instantly reminded me of the Lord of the Rings books, where Pippin, in the chapter The Urukai, awakens to discover that he and Mary have been captured by the orcs. This scene has much the same feeling. A Rondir is then accosted by an orc named Vrath, played by a very well-known New Zealand actor the one and only Jed Brophy, who played several orcs, uh, a rider of Rohan, an elf, and even a Nazgul in the Lord of the Rings films. And we can't forget his starring role as Dory in the Hobbit films. It's nice to see him back in orc gear once more. Arondir discovers that his fellow elves from the castle defense have also been captured. They are now slaves driven to dig a winding tunnel across the Southlands. I expect the tunnels are used to hide the orc advance and shield them from the sun. The elves also think the orcs are searching for something, likely the sword taken by Theo. I love everything about these orcs. Unlike the freakish orc from episode 2, 
These remind me of the orcs created by Weta Workshop for the Lord of the Rings films. They are violent, brutish, and cruel, as we see when we are introduced to the orc captain. A sly and cruel orc that taunts the elves with water and then cuts the throat of Medhor, friend of Arondir, after they refuse to cut down a massive tree. Arondir, knowing they will all die if he doesn't obey, tells the leader he will cut down the tree. Later, when the sun is at its highest, we see the captive elves enact a plan of escape. The elven watch warden wants at least one captive to escape and make for the tree line to bring back an army of elves. They whipsaw their chains and take down their orc guards. As they try to break their chains, the orcs begin pulling them back under the canopy. A run deer leaps up the line of chain and cuts the rope holding up the canopy, which falls away. The orcs are burned by the sun. It appears the orcs of the Second Age are affected by the sun in a much more severe way. Their skin smokes and burns. We know the orcs of the Third Age hate the sun, but perhaps this severe reaction has been bred out of them over thousands of years. This seems to be a key feature in this new series. The enraged orc captain orders the release of the warg. Oh my, such a sense of joy in this. This warg looks like a warg. Part wolf, part monster. I absolutely love it. Apparently, what we've seen in the Vales of Anduin by the Harfoot's camps are not wargs, but wolves, or at least some kind of wolf creature. This new creature is definitely a Tolkien warg. Can't wait to see more. The warg furiously butchers two elves and nearly kills a rundeer, who traps it in a pile of brush. I have to say the showrunners for this new series have no problem showing blood and carnage on screen, though so far it seems appropriate to the story. We then see Revion, the elven watch warden, break his chains and make his escape. He is nearly killed by a warg, but a rondeer kills it with an orc axe. Unfortunately, as a rondeer watches, Reverian is pierced with two arrows by orcs hiding along the tree line. He falls to his death as orcs drag a rondeer back into the pit. This emotional scene is capped by the moment we have all been waiting for. The orc captain calls for Adar. We then see the shots from the trailer of Adar coming through the ranks of orcs who clearly fear him. We see him walking out of the shadows, but we cannot yet see his face. Bang! The episode ends. Wow, talk about a cliffhanger ending. This show just keeps getting better and better. If you want to hear my thoughts on Adar, 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 it sounds like he is pronounced Adar, you can go here and find out more. Hopefully he will be revealed in the next episode. Well guys, I hope this was an informative breakdown of episode three. Uh, keep your eyes open for the next one and let me know in the comments section if there's anything more you'd like to see in my creation of these uh, breakdowns of each episode. Um, so, until next time, I hope to see you on the fiery road from Badadur to Mount Doom.